and good evening and welcome to the uh, brand new uh, show that we're going to be doing called Rail Fanning for Beginners on Train Aficionado Live. So we're going to cover, you know, kind of the basics of, of being a rail fan out there. If you're new to the hobby, um, this is kind of like your general, you know, things to know while you're rail fanning and kind of tips and tricks that I'll be able to share with you. And some of you, of course, are active rail fans, so you may know this already. Certainly you can chime in with some of the stuff um, that I may have missed on uh, tonight's presentation. But we're going to have a great show for you tonight. Um, and of course, you know, you know, we'll answer your questions at the end of the presentation as well. Um, so definitely stay for the full hour. We're happy that you're here joining us. Let's uh, start the slideshow right now. All right, so rail fanning for beginners. So this is kind of our version of rail fanning for dummies, but we didn't want to we didn't want to call it rail fanning for dummies. So basically, if you want to support the channel, you can always do that through our website trainaficionado.com and uh, check out our store. We've got hats, t-shirts, and so much more on our website. Hoodies and all types of cool things, travel mugs. We even have a um, a pad for your computer if you're spending a lot of time at the computer, um, which is really cool as our train aficionado logo on it. And of course, finally, we've got we've got some uh, baseball hats as you can see there. They're actually embroidered, and we've got some cool uh, other hat uh, other uh, t-shirts like uh, straight out of Bailey Yard. And the the straight the eye there is actually if you look very closely, it is a rail spike. So some cool stuff there so of course you know shopping our store certainly helps us out the other thing that you can do if you're brand new to the channel hit the subscribe button on youtube hit that uh, uh make sure you hit the bell for notifications and of course you can sign up for all of our other social media as well facebook twitter youtube and instagram our next show we're steamrolling right into may will be Wednesday, May the 3rd, 8 p.m. Eastern Time, 5 p.m. Pacific, live right here on the Train Aficionado YouTube channel. So we're looking forward to that show as well. We may even do some trackside shows. Um, now that it's actually staying light later, and uh, you know we may be able to do some live trackside shows as well. So we're looking forward to some cool stuff coming up in the... Uh, spring summer and fall of course now those are the best times of the year to go rail fanning uh, especially if you're um, in a uh, climate where it gets extremely cold in the winter months you're not doing too much of that during the winter months but of course you know it's a great time to do it spring uh, summer and fall so this was a suggestion from one of you that watched the show so rail fanning for beginners kind of our uh, rail fanning for dummies type of show so we're going to give you all the tips tricks and everything that you need to know for doing that and of course you know dale's checking in um from montana where the winter weather is back it doesn't seem to be going away um less is checking in mild and 51 up in canada so yes there's a lot of uh Hey, gentleman from uh, Attleboro checking in, or a lady, um, Trackside Bench. Um, so welcome to the show. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, what is rail fanning? Where do I begin? So rail fans are basically who are uh, hobbyists of railroads or model railroads. They're railroad enthusiasts. So, you know, trackside rail fanning. There's model trains. There's rail cams. There's even some clubs out there. I actually belong to a couple of clubs. Um, the Cincinnati uh, uh, Railroad Club. And I also belong to the Mystic Valley Railway Association out in Massachusetts. Um, so I belong to a couple of clubs. Um, you know, They're great to be able to get you together with people that have the same common interests. Of course, there's a lot of rail cams out there. Of course, our friends over at um, Railstream that you know have been uh, guests on this show certainly check out uh, their website, Railstream, and also check out their app. They actually have an app on the smart TV. You know, if you've got Apple TV or 
uh, Roku, you can download the Railstream app and they have several cameras that are free on there that you can watch. And it's certainly some really great high quality video. And then model trains. There are tons and tons of clubs for model trains. There's, you know, the organizations that are nationwide. There's some that are local. There's uh, uh, people that have a, a club where they have a layout where people, may, you know, work on the layout together. Um, and, of course, you know, have meetings and, and, and what have you to kind of build uh, on that uh, layout. Photograph here, um, since, uh, you know, there's a photograph on the screen. This was actually taken in Hamilton, Ohio. And I was able to get this. Uh, this is on the Indiana subdivision, if I'm remembering correctly, um, coming into uh, downtown Hamilton, um, right where the old Hamilton Depot used to be. So uh, I stumbled across, you know, this train coming down this line. There's only a couple of uh, trains that actually frequent uh, this line um, daily. So it's a it's a great and a uh, great opportunity to be able to capture uh, this train here. So other names for rail fans. So you may have heard a couple of them. You know, it's rail fan, rail buff, train buff, uh, railway enthusiast, railway buff, and a train spotter. And of course, you know, train aficionado here, which I consider, you know, hopefully myself as a train aficionado, uh, and in very many senses, you know, not only you know as uh, uh, full-size trains, but also I have uh, an interest in model trains as well. So let's take a look at some of the basic equipment that you need trackside. Now, these are not things that are terribly expensive. You may actually have some of these things laying around your house. You know, this may be stuff that... Um, you know, that, you know, you may actually have. And you're, geez, geez, I didn't think of bringing, you know, that with me trackside. So let's take a look um, at a couple of those things. Binoculars. Okay. So how did I come up with this one? So my dad and I, you know, we rail fanned quite a bit um, in North Carolina. And of course, we rail fans, you know, in a couple other places when we were living up in the Northeast. And of course, you know, we're, we're at the rail fanning spot where it's safe to be able to rail fan. And then the signal is way down on the tracks. So you're basically, you know, doing one of these, trying to squint in to be able to see the signal. So, of course, my dad ended up saying, boy, I really wish I had my old binoculars. He had these really cool older binoculars. So for one Christmas, I actually purchased him a brand new pair of binoculars you know, has the case and everything, and um, and he and he's taken it rail fanning with him ever since. So you know, basically, if you want to look at that signal that's way down the tracks, you're wondering, you know, what the colors are. He puts the binoculars on and is able to say, "Oh, look, we got a green signal. We got something coming." So binoculars is definitely something great to have. I actually have finally have a pair of my own binoculars to be able to be able to look at those signals. I just have to now remember when I go rail fanning to bring it with me. Um, I don't leave it in the car, especially during the winter months, but now, now that it's warmer, I'll be able to throw it in the vehicle and be able to uh, bring it with me. But a good set of binoculars, you know, they're, they vary in prices. You know, you can get, what, about $50, $60, and then you can get, you know, very expensive ones, you know, a couple hundred dollars. So, and some of the great places that you can find those is a lot of those outdoor stores, such as, um, what is it, Bass Pro Shop and uh, Cabela's, you know, will have them. If you're looking for a decent, high quality uh, set of binoculars, of course, you can look on the big uh, web giant out there called Amazon, and you may be able to find some there. And, of course, there's a lot of online stores. But, yeah, you definitely want to get a decent pair of binoculars uh, to be able to see those signals or even peer down, you know, the tracks to see if you can see a train coming or a crossing going down or what have you. I mean, they certainly come in handy. A lightweight camping chair. How many of you spend a lot of time trackside? You know, you're standing up, walking around. 
you know, why don't you get a little comfortable? If you're going to set up shop for the day, track side, if you're rail fanning along the horseshoe curve at the various locations, it's a beautiful sunny day, you know, rather than sitting in the car, you know, get out the camp chair, sit there, you know, and uh, relax. And of course, it's got a beverage holder. So have a nice cool drink as you're as you're sitting there rail fanning, but a lightweight camping chair. Now, why did I say lightweight? So some of these rail fanning spots, you kind of have to hike out. So what I'm recommending is something that you can carry with you that doesn't weigh a ton. You know, you want to be able to walk out, you know, to that uh, safe rail fanning spot, you know, with your gear and your in your camp chair, of course, you know, and you want something that's lightweight to be able to bring with you. And of course, uh, you know, these fold up camping chairs are great. You can put it in the trunk or in the back of your vehicle. Doesn't take up terribly much room. Um, and of course, you can enjoy the beauty of sitting outside, getting some fresh air, and of course, waiting for the next train to arrive. All right, summer months coming up, you know, where it's going to be warmer. So you want to make sure that you stay hydrated. You know, you want to bring some bottles of water. And you know the other thing? Snacks! I mean, you could get hungry, you know, while you're out bouncing from one location to another. Or, you know, chasing a train. Maybe you're not going to, uh, you know, you're going to be all over the place for the day. You know, carry some snacks with you. And definitely bottles of water. You want to definitely stay uh, hydrated. So that's certainly um, certainly helpful. Joe Bearcat, you know, that's a great, great thing on the camp chair dual purpose you're absolutely right that cup holder aka can carry the beverage and it also can be a great spot to put your scanner so if you got one of those camp chairs that has the dual um cup holders one for your beverage and one for your scanner i mean yes joe you're absolutely correct and that's our friend joe bearcat you know, he typically is on with our Scanner Guys show, and he's made his way over here. And, of course, Joe, we're going to talk about a, a radio that's particular dear to our hearts coming up in a little bit. So, tech equipment. <laughs> we're transitioning right to it, practically. Great segue. So, some of the tech equipment, of course, it's going to cost a little bit more money. You definitely want to, you know... You know, save up for this. I mean, typically, a lot of the tech equipment could be your primary uh, piece of equipment that you're using for rail fanning. It could be a secondary thing that's helping you to be a better rail fan out there. So let's talk about um, cameras. So, of course, uh, I have a Nikon. Matter of fact, it's this model, the Nikon D5600. Um, of course, Nikon Canon are the main camera manufacturers it's personal preference so basically you know you when shopping for a camera you're basically going to do your research you're going to figure out which scanner best fits you for me i've had nikons i really like the product i like the menu i like the the setup of it for you maybe the canon will be the better option or one of those other camera manufacturers now dslr is a lot better for rail fanning voices a point and shoot type of camera um, I started with a point and shoot when I got back into the hobby in 2013 you know doing some photographing and of course I was along the Northeast corridor and trying to take a photograph of the Acela going over a hundred miles an hour so with the point and shoot the processing wasn't fast enough so basically what was happening, I was getting a blurry image or you know of the Acela, so it wasn't clear. So I ended up upgrading to a DSLR, and then I ended up upgrading to a lens that was my utility lens, which is an 18 to 200 uh, lens, which gives me a wide range. So basically with my Nikon, when I did buy it, I had an 18 to 55, and then I forgot what the other kit lens. So there was two kit lenses. So what I did is I ended up purchasing a lens that would eliminate, you know, switching back and forth in between the kit lenses. Of course, the 18 to 55 was great for photographs up close, but if I was shooting further away, you know, I need I need that lens that's going to be able to give me that zoom range. So I ended up getting a kit lens. 
uh, to get rid of the kit lenses and doing strictly uh, one lens that would do it all. And uh, so I would strongly recommend, you know, taking a look at cameras, but cameras are an investment. Keep in mind, you know, sometimes, you know, these Sam Club, BJ's, Costco, sometimes will have a really good package deal to be able to get you into a camera like this. You know, it comes with the kit lenses, it comes with um, SD cards and such like that. So you may be able to get something like that at one of those big uh, box stores. Um, and something to start out. I mean, they are a bit pricey, but certainly, you know, the photography is really cool. The other thing, too, when I started in this hobby back in the day with my dad, it was film. So, of course, you know, you take photographs, you bring it over to the local uh, place for processing. You have no clue how they came out. And then, you know, some of them were good, some of them were bad. With a digital camera, you've got instant gratification because you snap that photo, you're able to see on the screen, because it's digital photography, you're able to see, ooh, this one's a good one, or let me see if I can grab a couple more shots. You know, let's say you're trying to get it far away and you're trying to get it up close. You know, there's a lot more to it, you know, being able to see. And of course, when I was a kid, I was no, uh, yeah, I was a really amateur photographer and I'm still not a, I'm not a professional photographer by any means. But I noticed, you know, my um, skills have gotten better and better over the years. You know, I don't consider myself a professional. You know, I try to do the best I can with it. I mean, if you want to see a lot of my photos that I've taken over the years, check out um, the Train Aficionado Instagram account. You'll be able to see a lot of the photos there. Some of them are on the Facebook page as well. Um, so I've been trying to get better and better at it. But yeah, I mean, I've gotten some really cool pictures over the years. But yeah, I mean, the camera is certainly an investment. You know, you could spend, you know, on a lens, the lens that I bought, I got it on sale for about 600 and some odd dollars, I think. And I ended up purchasing it from a camera store and they had that, you know, six month um, interest free credit card. So what I ended up doing is over the over that six months or whatever, uh, 12 months, I ended up doing the monthly payments until, you know, until I had it paid off. And luckily, it was an interest-free card. So as long as you, you know, pay it off before the time, that's a good thing. But yeah, I mean, a camera is certainly great. Um, the other thing that people are getting involved with in the hobby is drones. So the cool thing about that is getting those aerial shots, getting shots of the trains where they are, you know, not easily to get, you know, because you're able to fly the drone to that spot and take a photograph. Of course, our our show friend Danny Harmon has, of course, a drone which he uses for video, but you can also use the the drone for still photography as well. So if you wanted to get some really cool aerial shots, um, that can be done. Bit pricey. The other thing that you have to keep in mind with drones is you need to know how to operate it well and you may want to get certified you know as a drone operator so one you know what you're doing the other thing too is there's also an app uh, that you can install on your smartphone and you know where you can fly and where you can't fly your drone so there's a lot to it i'm a member of the cincinnati railroad club we're actually going to have at some point a presentation on drones. So basic uh, presentation uh, about drones. And we may actually, um, during that presentation, we may actually share that on the uh, Train Aficionado uh, YouTube channel as well uh, with a live uh, uh, class, which would be great. So do, certainly be on the lookout for that. But yeah, uh, digital uh, cameras are great. The other thing that, you know, while we're on the topic of cameras is video cameras as well. I mean, video cameras have gotten a little bit more affordable. Um, of course, you know, some of the consumer cameras, they're okay. I mean, if you're looking to shoot professional, of course, you know, you know, you get what you pay for in the grand scheme of things. And while we're on cameras, tripods, especially for a long range shot, you want to get a tripod to be able to hold either this camera or your video camera steady especially when you're shooting a long range shot because um any little movement is going to you know show up in the video so definitely some good stuff there 
Um, but yeah, I mean, a lot about cameras there. Uh, I, I, we could probably do a whole show on it. Uh, I would love to get some other people that take uh, railroad photography and, and getting them on just to kind of give their expertise. You know, I'm not professional by any means, but I do know my way around a camera. This is something we never talk about. We talk about it all the time. Just kidding. Is a scanner. The scanner is definitely a valuable tool. Not as expensive as a camera, a video camera, or a drone. Um, the 125AT goes for about $130. And, um, $130. and it's a affordable scanner. It's analog. Um, it's simple to program. It's got an alpha tag display, which is really nice. So you can program in the frequencies. And then um, you can even set it up. So banks one and two, which I teach during my class, set those up for the 97 railroad channels. So basically channel one um, would be, um, you know, the same channel one for the railroads. So let's say if the dispatcher tells the crew to go to channel 16 you could hit hold on your radio hit 16 and then hold brings you right to it the great thing is it's a bank driven scanner so you can still do that so yes it's a it's a it's a great scanner it doesn't cost very much um, pretty much any scanner will work uh, for rail fanning as long as it's got the 160 to 161 megahertz the railroads are currently all in analog there's a few exceptions that are running NXDN, such as, um, you know, some short lines, uh, some yards, and maybe some tourist trains that are running NXDN. For the most part, all the big seven, a lot of the majority of the short lines are running analog. So um, eventually, NXDN will come about, and then, of course, we'll need to look at a different scanner at that point. But as of right now, the 125 AT, for now and until the foreseeable future, is the scanner to go with. And of course, it's got 500 channels, uh, 50 channels per bank. Uh, simple to program. Basically, if I was to instruct you on how to program it right now, basically, you would hit function program, which is uh, PGM, which is the E button. Once that's done, it's going to load a menu. And then you're going to basically program on the frequency, program an alpha tag. But first, before you do that, you're going to go uh, hold, go to the channel you want to program. Let's say it's channel 5. So you hit the 5 button and then hold. It'll bring you to that channel and then you would program in those frequencies. So it's relatively simple. Runs on AA batteries. It can be plugged into the wall. It can also be used in the vehicle uh, using a USB connection. A lot of our US, uh, cars have USB plugs. If you don't have a USB plug, you can get a um, USB to cigarette lighter adapter uh, uh, plug for it. Of course, this radio you know, has a USB cable, which you can plug in for programming. And you can also do it to a wall wart, an AC adapter, and plug it into that. So this radio, if you don't have this, it's a valuable tool. Now, why a scanner? One, you're able to see where the, you know, not see, but able to hear where the trains are coming from. Get yourself familiar with the mile post and where you're at along the line. You'll hear the radio dispatcher communicating to a train. And they may say, you know, something about, you know, you know, in between mile posts, such and such is a speed restriction. And if you're in between that particular, those mile posts, then you know there's a train coming your way. There's also defect detectors that you can hear. Uh, a lot of times knowing your place on the tracks will, you know, if you hear, you know, one of these defect detectors, basically, um, you know, mile post, you know, blah, 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 no defects and so on. You'll hear that over the radio and they'll say the mile post over the radio. So you'll know that the train has cleared that. And if, and if you're somewhere along there, you know that there's a train coming towards you, which is great. Um, so the scanner is certainly handy. The other thing that I teach in my class about the scanner, railroad communication is line of sight. So more often you're going to hear the dispatcher versus the train and the crew. A lot of times when you hear the train and crew, that means that they're relatively close to you. So line of sight basically meaning no repeater. 
Um, basically, police and fire use what's called a repeater, so you're able to hear the communication wherever you're at in town. In this case, you know, it's line of sight. So if you use those little um, family band radios, that's line of sight communication. Eventually, you know, you're going to be, you know, if you, if you both started together and then went in opposite directions, eventually you would be um, not able to hear each other. Um, NXDN, a great question, Jim. Uh, basically, I can think of a few uh, short railways that are using it. Uh, the Conway Scenic uh, Railroad in um, New Hampshire, I believe I'm, that's the proper name of it. It, may, it could be a little different than that. But that Conway train up in New Hampshire, they're using NXDN. Uh, another... Um, another one that you can... Uh, listen to NXDN is, um, what is it, Mystic uh, Steam Railroad out in Connecticut. I know I'm butchering the name. I you know, Off the top of my head, I don't have the proper name. It's Steam and Ship. You know, there's a basically Steam and Boat. You know, it's a combination. You can uh, do that. But, you know, that is definitely um, there. Uh, like Dale's mentioning, a lot of yards, uh, switching crews are using NXDN because it's in a close environment. Um, the reason being uh, NXDN hasn't became current is all the railroads have to do it all at once. You know, you think of how many lines that Amtrak is using um, where they're basically a visitor on that particular line. You think of all the foreign power that you see out there. Basically, all those cab radios have to be NXDN capable. Until all those radios are NXDN capable and all the portable radios are NXDN capable, um, you're going to, you know, you're going to have to wait because you can't have, uh, you know, other train, you know, other. Uh, foreign power going in and you can't communicate everybody's got to be on the same wavelength per se you know basically being either on analog or digital you know everybody's got to be on there um you, you notice i said upgrading that radio basically when they do upgrade the cab radio and the portable radios those digital radios have capability of analog so a lot of times what will happen is they'll start replacing the radios with NXDN capable radios and still use analog until one they make the switch or two you know they may have ability to communicate to that yard crew or you know if they're an isolated railroad you know it doesn't matter you know they can use NXDN because there's no other foreign railroad coming onto their line so some really cool stuff and interesting and we can spend all night talking about you know listening to the action on a scanner uh, we have some videos out there, you know, talking about rail fanning with a scanner. So if you're brand new to the channel, check that out. Uh, Train Aficionado on YouTube, which you're watching right now. Uh, check out some of those videos. Um, hopefully we'll do some more in-depth videos with the 125 AT since it's certainly a great radio for uh, rail fanning. So uh, finding those spots, we could spend a lot of time talking about this tonight. But let's uh, dive into a couple of quick things. Google Maps is your friend. So with the great thing about Google Maps, you're able to see, of course, the satellite or the um, Earth view, uh, being able to see where the tracks are. You're able to see the map view. The other thing that Google Maps offers is street level. And not only Google Maps, Bing Maps offers as well. So you're able to kind of spot some public places where you can rail fan. Maybe a, a parking lot that's a public parking lot or a park where the railroad line goes along. You want to look for places that are safe and secure where you can, where you can rail fan in a public spot. You don't want to do it on private property and you certainly don't want to do it on railroad property. So Google Maps is certainly a great thing. And also while we're talking about Google, doing a Google search Best places to rail fan in Cincinnati, Ohio. Best places to rail fan Altoona, Pennsylvania. You're, you're going to come up with various websites. They're going to have uh, suggested 
locations. Depending on the website, they may give you a parking location or even a rail fanning pavilion, you know, where you can basically rail fan right there at a pavilion. Um, if you're uh, going out to Altoona, uh, Pennsylvania, trainaficionado.com, a uh, personal plug there. Um, there is the ultimate rail fanning guide for Altoona, Pennsylvania. So definitely check that out on my website. But yeah, I'm trying to build a lot more of these rail fanning guides so you can kind of take advantage of that and get the most when you're going out to a particular location. I'm actually working on right now one for the Cincinnati area uh, since this is where I call home base right now. And I'm trying to provide you guys, you know, if you come up here, you know, some locations where one, you can rail fan safely and two, some tips about that location. Are you able to hear a, a track detector? You know, where are there um, sidings? Because you'll hear those over the radio. What mileposts are near there? Or common locations that you would hear over the scanner. You know, McGonagall was one of them that I kind of uh, went out and, and saw last weekend. It was along one of the rail lines uh, over here. And I loved, uh, you know, going out there. Actually, I had a train sitting on the tracks there, and I was able to kind of photograph it. And I hear McGonagall a lot, and I know it's a siding. So typically when they're talking about McGonagall, there's something in the siding, and they're waiting on another train because basically it's a single-line track. Um, so they kind of have to wait in that siding for the other train to pass, and then, of course, they can move along uh, their route. Now, a lot of uh, maps are basically um, geared towards, you know, streets and such. There is the rail map or open railway maps. Um, of course, you can download the app uh, for railway maps uh, for Apple and Android, about $2 if you want to purchase this, uh, this app for your phone. Of course, on your, on your computer, you can look at it for free. And then, of course, you should be able to pull up the website in the, on, the, on a browser such as uh, Chrome or whatever is on your phone. Uh, what is it? Safari. And I, I'm not too sure what the browser is on Android. But, you know, the, the app makes it a little bit more friendlier on the smartphone um, because it's basically made for the web-based. But, yeah, OpenRailwayMaps.com, I believe, is the website. And then uh, Railway Map uh, is the app on Apple and Android. And this is really cool because it focuses on the railroad lines. It's it's laser focused on that. And uh, basically, you can also see not only the active lines, the abandoned lines, and you can also see who operates on that line. It'll say, you know, Norfolk Southern um, Carolina Division or whatever it may be. So you'll know, oh, that's a Norfolk Southern line. That's a CSX line. That's a BNSF or a UP line. You'll be able to see all of that uh, right on the uh, on this mapping, which is great because it's it's focused on the railroad tracks versus most you know Google Maps and Bing Maps are, are focused on more so on you know roadways and highways and and such. Heritage units, and you know, this is something really cool because they're starting, as Norfolk Southern's actually bringing in the various heritage units in to do maintenance and touch up their paint and take care of them. So uh, we may have, you know, a lot of heritage units coming out of uh, Altoona, you know, getting a, you know, a fresh coat of paint or cleaned up. I mean, a lot of the heritage units for Norfolk Southern are looking a bit weathered and... Um, you know, definitely need some TLC. So the Heritage Unit app is free. Um, you, of course, can sign up and be a member. And then you can report when you see a Heritage Unit or a special train on the app. Um, of course, you can do it through the app. And, of course, you can track Heritage Units through the website, Heritage Units uh, website. So you can either do it of, of the two places. The other cool thing about it, you can also look up under the, the the more which you can see in the bottom right on the app you can actually look up train symbols on there as well so you hear over the scanner l56 so what you can do is look up l56 you can see what type of train it is what they're carrying whether it's um general goods you know auto racks intermodal 
So the, the, the app not only is great for tracking heritage units, but it also is great for looking up those symbols. You know, so if you want to know what that train is carrying um, or the start origination and destination, you can look it up right in the app, which is really awesome. And of course, if you see a heritage unit or a special train, when I'm track side, I tend to, you know, post it. And of course, you'll be able to know it's me. I'm under train aficionado. Uh, big surprise there. But yeah, um, anytime that I'm track side and I do see it, the great thing about the Heritage Unit app, the reports you get on there are from fellow rail fans. So when you post something on there that a Heritage Unit's gone north on whatever line or east or west or south, you're helping a fellow rail fan down the line to be able to hope to get it. And then, of course, that rail fan hopefully will, will do the same thing when it travels through their town. They're able to... Uh, you know, report it as well, helping the next rail fan down the line. So definitely, if you haven't downloaded the Heritage Unit app, certainly download it as a free app, and it's a really cool app for, of course, tracking some of those Heritage Units and also using it uh, for the symbols that you may hear on the scanner as well. So, safety first, safety always. Now, of course, you know, we may be a spectator on the railroad line, but we want to be safe when we're doing this. So here's a whole bunch of things. A lot of you hopefully know this. Of course, no trespassing. You don't want to trespass on railroad property. You don't want to go into their yards. You don't want to, you know, walk down their tracks. You want a rail fan from a safe location. As I mentioned earlier, a rail fanning pavilion is great. Or a public place where you can sit in a parking lot. Or, you know, a park. Uh, there's a lot of great places that you can do it. You may be able to stand on a sidewalk, which is public, uh, and be able to rail fan. And the other thing, too, is you want to keep your distance. The thing is, is, you know, this is a train that's going past. Anything can happen. You know, a derailment could happen. You want to make sure you keep your distance. You don't want to be in the way of the train if anything ever occurred. You always want to make sure that you keep your distance. The other thing I recommend is rail fan with a buddy. A lot of times, you know, when I was rail fanning along the Northeast Corridor and I was on a platform, which was a public place, I would have my eye in the lens and it would be a double track. And then, you know, maybe the train's on the other track. Um, and I'm trying to take a photo, usually I have somebody with me a lot of times will let me know that there's a train coming up behind me. So because my eye is in the lens, you know, getting ready to take the photo, you know, I don't want to be startled. I, although that I'm in a safe distance from, from the tracks of a course. But, you know, the thing is, is, you know, it can startle you, especially in the Northeast Corridor. Be aware of your surroundings. Yeah, you definitely want to be aware of it. I mean... You know, there is uh, some places that are quite safe to rail fan. And then there's others, you know, you may be okay during the daytime hours. And if you're rail fanning there at night, it may not be the base, best place and safest place to be. Stay off the tracks. I can't emphasize that enough. I mean, you only want to cross those tracks where you can uh, cross. Yes, um, Casey asked... If I'm a member of the Cincinnati Railroad Club, yes, I am. Um, I've been doing some classes on Saturdays, um, the first Saturday of each month. We actually are having, uh, next month, we're taking the scanner class out on the road, and we're actually going to be rail fanning at a popular location right around the Cincinnati area. So we'll be announcing that on the Train Aficionado website under events. So if you're from the Cincinnati area... You don't have to be a member of the Cincinnati Railroad Club to join us, but it'll be a great time. It'll be a bunch of us guys and gals, um, rail fanning trackside. You also want to be respectful. Now keep in mind, there are some obnoxious people out there. Now, mind you, we're photographing people at work. We're photographing, you know, the railroad crew, you know, working, whether they're 
going past you or doing a switching job on a track. <coughs> Excuse me. You want to be respectful. You don't want to bother them. They're at work. They're trying to do their job. Some of which, you know, it's just a job to them. A lot of times it is, you know, some of them are actually rail fans. They, you know, they, they work in the railroad industry and they also, um, you know, uh, you know, love trains as well. So, you know, I typically my rule of thumb is I, you know, I a wave or a smile. I mean, sometimes they wave back, sometimes they don't. Um, I actually had a crew member, you know, talk to me last weekend, which was pretty awesome, um, being able to chit chat with them. But yeah, I mean, they're at work, so just be respectful to them. You know, of course, you know, photograph, you know, be reasonable. Don't, you know, tell them how to do their job. I mean, that's their job. We're, we're, we're just rail fans, um, enthusiasts just watching them, you know, at work. And then, of course, taking photographs or video or wherever it may be. So safety first. And another thing that I'll mention, if you are rail fanning, make sure, you know, you clean up after yourself. So if you, um, you ended up, you know, setting up shop in a park or somewhere where you're sitting in your camp chair watching trains, you know, clean up after yourself. You know, if you brought any cans or wrappers or anything, make sure you dispose of those and and take care of uh, your your litter and such. You don't want to be littering. Um, I was trying to think of some other things. But yeah, definitely safety first. While trackside. So these are things to keep in mind while you're out there. So... How to know when the train is coming? Well, if you're rail fanning by a crossing, that's an easy one. Basically, you'll see the the arm goes down, the lights going on, the bells ringing. And if it's as long as it's not a quiet train crossing, you will hear the horn blowing. If it is a quiet um, uh, train crossing, you know... uh, you know, you're going to have to pay attention to lights. The other thing um, is the signals as well. So uh, pay attention to the signals. Of course, there's a ton of websites that kind of describe what the signals mean. Um, so definitely check that out. And signals vary from railroad to railroad depending on the line. You know, certain signals for CSX and Norfolk Southern and other lines may slightly different meanings. For the most part, they are um, very similar. Typically, when you see a green indication, there's something coming, um, depending on where that's positioned on the, on the lights. Sometimes there's three beacons. Sometimes there's two. Um, usually, that's a great indication. If you see all red, that typically means nothing's coming in that particular direction. If you're able to see on the other side of the signal, you know, for the trains approaching in the other direction, you know, there may be something coming. If it's all right on that side, then you're not having anything. So, of course, you know, having the ability to read signals, if you're by a uh, section where you can read them, being by a crossing, you know, being able to hear the uh, the train's uh, horn blowing um, is another thing. So there's a lot of great things there. Of course, the biggest question I get all the time for people entering to rail fans, is there some place I can pick up a schedule? Freight runs on its own type of schedule. Sometimes it runs on time. Sometimes it can run late. So typically, there are trains that run daily, depending on when they get released out of the yard. They're not like passenger service. Passenger trains such as Amtrak or any commuter rail leave a destination at a particular time and need to arrive at their stops at a particular time so passengers know when to board the train. So it's a little bit different. If you're rail fanning like um, commuter rail or Amtrak, it runs on a schedule. Now, keep in mind, a lot of the Amtrak long haul trains can run late. But there are some applications that you can track the Amtrak trains. You know, you can do it through their website. There's also another third party site where you're able to track, you know, the trains on there, which is really cool. And then depending on your local uh, commuter rail, there may be some websites for that as well. (coughs) 
Sorry about that. <coughs> okay. <clears throat> so, a lot of talking tonight. So, the other thing to consider when you're rail fanning, and especially for heritage units out and about, or a freight train, not a freight train, a steam train, either, you know, like the UP locomotive that goes out the steam train or 611 doing a ferry move a lot of rail fans will be out in droves so you need to be respectful typically what i recommend is when you're out rail fanning and you're the first one thank you when you're the first one at a rail fanning location typically that rail fan decides where they're going to take the photo other rail fans will f file in and typically will create a photo line. So basically, you don't want to have people in front of you when you're trying to take photos. It's a respect thing. So, you know, usually the first person on site, you know, typically kind of dictates it. If you're just there to watch the train, pay attention to the people that are taking photos. You don't want to be in their shot. Make sure you're courteous. You know, the other thing, too, is if you're not sure... You know what type of shot they're gonna do ask the fellow rail fan out there i'm not in your shot i'm not in your way just let me know if i am the it, it, respect goes a long way and especially if you're out there photoing and doing video you don't want to you don't want to cross the photo line basically everybody will eventually create like a photo line and you know and the great thing about it, it's just the train you don't have a bunch of uh, people in the front of it Unless you want to take photos with people in it, you can do that. But for the most part, a lot of people, when it's a special train going through, um, they're trying to get the train. They're trying to get the steam locomotive. So make sure that you're cognizant of that. Um, scanner manners. Um, these are certain things that you want to keep in mind. Now, there's some states that scanners on a person's uh, person is not allowed. So, you know, if you're in one of those states and you are using a scanner, be aware of your surroundings. If the police, you know, are patrolling, put the scanner away. And the other thing, too, is, you know, turn the scanner down as well if you, you know, if they are just traveling by. You don't want it to be loud drawing attention to it. The other thing, if you're riding, let's say, Amtrak or a commuter rail train, the great thing about scanners, they all have a headphone jack. So if you want to listen to your scanner on, you know, uh, Amtrak or commuter rail, put in a, you know, headphones or put in an earbud in one of your ears and then you're able to listen to the scanner. You want to make sure that you park in an appropriate spot. You know, you want to be able to park um, and hopefully in a public uh, location. You don't want to park near the tracks or, you know, on top of a crossing god forbid you know the train derails you're par you're not in an appropriate parking spot your insurance company may not cover you know your car being damaged if they find out that you parked your car deliberately there um and it's not a parking spot the other thing to keep in mind in case of emergency now the great thing of us being rail fans we serve as eyes and ears to the railroad now, a lot of people are not educated on what to do in case of emergency. So let's say you see somebody's car break down on the railroad crossing. Most of us rail fans know to go to the crossing buck. There is a blue sign that's on there that has a 1-800 number and it has a location of that crossing. If ever an accident occurs... Um, for accident occurs on the railroad crossing or a disabled vehicle or you see a car on the tracks, first thing you do before you call 911 is call that emergency number immediately. When you call that number, somebody will pick it up. They're going to ask you what crossing you're at. You're going to tell them what's going on. They're going to then communicate immediately to the dispatcher and let them know that there's something going on that track. They'll either stop service, you know, before that crossing. 
so we don't have a bigger emergency on hand. Yeah, you definitely want to call that that sign, uh, that number on that sign. It's a blue sign. So if you're new to rail fanning, the next time you go over the tracks, you will see um, a telephone number on there. It's going to say who operates on that line, CSX, Norfolk Southern, UP, or whatever it may be. And also it'll have a location number. So when you give a call, call that number, give them that location number, and tell them what's going on. And the great thing is about it is they'll communicate. And the next thing you call, you know, like you call the police department if it's an accident or a disabled vehicle, let them know as well. You can even tell them, hey, I've already contacted uh, CSX or Norfolk Southern. Um, but a lot of times people forget, you know, that these railroad lines are active lines. You know, they figure, you know, like they see an accident or a disabled vehicle, they're calling the police to call in the tow truck, and they forget to, to alert the railroad. I mean, the railroad doesn't know until they're right on top of it, and most of these trains cannot stop on a dime. So by the time they visually see the, the, the car on the crossing, they're throwing the, the train into emergency and locking up the brakes, but a lot of times it takes over a mile or more for the train to stop. So by the time the train stops, it could hit that vehicle and push it down the tracks. The other thing too, while you're calling that number, tell the individual that's in the vehicle, if they're able to get out of the vehicle, get out of the vehicle. Uh, worst case scenario, if the dispatcher is not notified in time, at least you know it's there. I mean, you can always replace a car. You can't replace a human being. Yep, always. I mean, the other thing too, like um, a bearable uh, mentioned, yeah, turn the volume down low at night. You know, the great thing, you know, you don't want it to be disturbing other people. And Dave mentioned, don't cross any of the yellow tape, you know, the CSIs, the what you, you know, all those things. You don't want to cross the yellow tape. So if there's anything going on, you know, set, let's say there is uh, some sort of uh, derailment or an accident or, or somebody gets hit by the, the train, you don't want to be crossing any of the yellow tape, that's for sure. Well, that was uh, our topic of discussion this evening, uh, talking about rail fanning for beginners. I'm hoping that kind of gave you a little bit of insight of things to keep in mind. You know, I kind of took a wide brush of everything, looking at it from a 35,000 foot view. Of course, a lot of these topics we've kind of dived into more in depth into an individual video. So if you're new to the channel, you say, boy, I wish he would have talked a little bit more about this. There may be likely a video on that topic. Of course, as you know, my friend there, Joe Bearcat, he knows that I talk about the 125 AT uh, like I'm on a com on commission from Uniden, but I'm not on commission from Uniden every time I say it. I just really love the radio. Um, and I've done a video about that. I've also done um, in-depth videos on using a scanner while rail fanning. So a lot of uh, good stuff on the channel. Of course, we're going to be adding some more stuff to the channel. We're also, we have the ability now, I just have to test it. We have an ability to uh, stream live uh, from, uh, from a rail fanning location. So you may see, you know, events where we're streaming live uh, from a rail fanning location on YouTube. So you can interact with me while I'm, while I'm uh, trackside. We can watch trains together, which will be really cool, bringing you in as a virtual audience. Uh, Dale brings up a great point. Um, also reporting anything that's malfunctioning or broken with a railroad crossing. Uh, such as the arms or um, the lights are activated and there's no train. Letting them know, the uh, the railroad know, they're basically going to put up a speed restriction. They know that the crossing is malfunctioning. So they're going to go through that area slower um, just so they um, nothing happens. You know, you, you probably, when a crossing is malfunctioning, people are going around. Uh, the the uh, 
crossing arms, you know, people are not abiding by waiting at the tracks, the whole nine yards. So them knowing, they know to make a lot of noise with the horn and to go slower through that area. So a lot of cool stuff there. And of course, um, you know, a lot of people saw the merger of, um, of the two railroads, uh, Kansas City and um, uh, CN, which is pretty cool. We saw that on, on, um, on social media all over the place. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with being a fan of the 125 AT. That's uh, for sure. I really love that radio. But yeah, um, being safe out there, I can't stress it enough. You know, being a responsible rail fan, um, there are a few people out there, which I will leave nameless, that are quote unquote rail fans, and they've made bad names for rail fans. You know, uh, you know, basically going into railroad property, trespassing, you know, posting videos of of railroad workers that may not have all their their uh, what is it called their uh, protective gear on. You know, I mean, if you do see, you know, that somebody doesn't have all their protective gear on, don't post it. You're going to get somebody in trouble. The other thing, too, is if you ever have an opportunity to go up in a cab in a locomotive, don't post it publicly. Don't do that. Because you could get somebody fired. I mean, they're allowing you to go up into the cab in the locomotive. And if you have permission from the railroad to be up there and they're okay with you posting it, then that's a different story. But if some uh, railroad crew says, hey, you want to come and take a look at the cab and take a few photos up there, don't post it anywhere. Because you could get, you know, you could get the, the locomotive number and they could figure out, put two or two together and the crew could get fired. So, you know, that's another thing to be respectful. Um, Dave's asking if anyone has a train horn in their personal vehicle. I do not. I mean, I've seen the videos out there where people scare the bejesus out of, out of, out of folks walking on sidewalks. Uh, a, a railroad uh, train horn typically can be heard up to seven miles. So you know, there's quite a distance. You know, typically at night, sometimes I'm you know I'm awake in bed and I can hear the train from quite a distance away, which is really cool. You know, being nice and quiet. But that's certainly a cool thing. We're coming up at the top of the hour. Um, it seems like I've been kind of answering a lot of people's questions during the presentation. Uh, I would love to be able to, if you're from the Ohio area, especially from Cincinnati, anytime that we're doing one of these rail fanning trackside things, if you want to come out and hang out and, and meet me, uh, by all means, that'll be awesome. I will be using uh, throughout the spring, summer, and fall the Train Aficionado event page. I need to update it right now. It has the last class. We're also going to a gentleman that I met at my last class named Joe. He is a professional when it comes to operating a drone. I'm probably going to have him on the show. He's also going to do a presentation for the uh, North Carolina Transportation Museum. North, um, no, sorry, what am I saying, North Carolina? The, <laughs> whoops, it's been a long day. Uh, for the Cincinnati Railroad Club, not the North Carolina Transportation Museum, sorry. Whew. Um, but yeah, uh, he'll be doing a presentation for that as well. So let me just wrap up a couple of slides before we before we call it a night. Um, let me just pull that up. There we go. All right, so tonight's show was Rail Fanning for Beginners. And uh, don't forget, you can support the channel by visiting our store, trainaficionado.com. Um, you know, you could check out our t-shirts, hats, uh, travel mugs, hoodies, and zip-ups, uh, and so forth. So make sure you check that out, trainaficionado.com. Join us for the next Train Aficionado show live right here on YouTube, which will be Wednesday, May the 3rd. 8 p.m. Eastern Time, 5 p.m. Pacific. Follow, like, and subscribe to Train Aficionado on our social media, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and Instagram. Um, and stay connected. 
with Train Aficionado. Uh, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and Instagram, of course, you know, for staying connected. And we also have on our website, which is called the Trackside Bulletin, which we occasionally send um, emails uh, through our social media uh, e-newsletter. So definitely sign up for that. We don't sell your information to anybody. You know, we basically guard and protect your information. Um, so certainly a good thing to keep in mind. Jim, funny you asked that. We've been in conversations with Danny Harmon. He may be making an appearance on the show relatively uh, relatively soon. So um, we'll be announcing that soon. I'm not sure why. I guess I'm going to be a little fuzzy. Oh, there it goes. Um, <laughs> sometimes it goes out of focus. Um, so Danny, yes, we've been in conversation with him um, to get him back on the show. Um, the last email that we sent out to him, he says he loves doing the live show and interacting with, with you guys. So definitely uh, be on the lookout for that. Uh, that's coming soon. We're trying to nail down the time and everything to get him on. And um, we hope to have him on as a regular guest. I'm certainly going to see if he's going to be more available to be able to be on to just talk about, you know, rail fanning in general. Uh, and even we could talk about some of his equipment that he uses and how he, you know, what what's the preparations that he takes for one rail fanning and operating his drone. So he's actually got a, a drone and a professional video camera. He also works for a television station down there in Tampa. So, you know, his, he's got a gig down there. And plus, you know, he does the rail fanning thing as well. So to everyone that's watched tonight, I appreciate you and everybody that's watching this after the broadcast. Thank you so much. We really appreciate each and every one of you that watch the show each and every week. Um, make sure you tell your friends about the show. Uh, subscribe to the channel. We're almost at 1,000 subscribers. So if you haven't already, uh, subscribe to the channel. If you like what you see, give us a thumbs up. We would greatly appreciate it. And then, of course, you know you can always comment in the in the um, on the video as well um, after it posts we appreciate that I try to read all your comments um, and I try to reply back to as many as I can but you know definitely be on the lookout you know at trainaficionado.com for some new events coming up and of course you know subscribe to the channel we can't say that enough I thank you so much uh, for watching be safe out there, rail fanning. Of course, it's approaching the warmer months. So, you know, get out there and do some rail fanning. And, and uh, certainly, uh, I hope I was able to provide you some tips and suggestions if you're new into the hobby. Until then, have a great night. We'll catch you again on the next Train Aficionado Live.